Okay, good morning. Um, welcome everyone to the first session in the data engineering track for on Monday, 9th of October. Um, we're very privileged to have with us Julian Hyde, who I believe is the original creator of um, Apache CultSite and now an Apache CultSite um, PMC member. And he's going to talk to us about um, building sem uh, semantic and, and metrics layer using Apache CultSite. I mean, it's quite a quite a big topic at the moment, so I'm very interested to hear what he has to say. So databases and relational databases have been with us for a long time, and it seems like SQL always wins, and the responsibilities of relational databases seem to only get greater over the years. So, you know, since I started in databases in the mid-90s, um, databases have expanded to deal with geospatial data, for example, post-GIS first and then others. Um, I did a startup uh, doing streaming SQL, so using database technology to handle streaming data. Databases store JSON documents, XML documents, um, there's work in you know in adding time series to databases, and yet, um, and you know, and many many other areas, right? Um, it's not just about flat records anymore. And yet, one of the original uses of relational databases, which is um, uh, analytics, um, has not been um, has not been solved by the SQL language. The business intelligence tools. Um, which were built on top of SQL databases, they still exist, and you know they're thriving. So their business. I, I work for Looker, which is um, part of Google Cloud BI. Um, uh, there's also Microsoft Power BI with its DAX language. There's Tableau with its LOD language, um, and yeah, they all work on top of relational databases, but they have their own query languages, and so. I just started thinking, why why is it that those business intelligence tools have, you know, we've not managed to solve the problem using SQL? What is it that they're doing that is so difficult for SQL to express? So, and the you know, the talk I've called this the semantic layer or the metrics layer. So what exactly do I mean by the semantic layer? I, I always hate when people use the word semantics because it implies like it's... Not the word semantics doesn't have very precise semantics, right? It just means so. Here's what you know abstractly the semantic layer is here's the business user on the left, right? Um, and here's the business user's data on the right. And the semantic layer really just needs to be this model in an AI sense or this 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 oracle between the user and his data that is going to. When the user has a question, what products are doing better this year, something needs to draw that question out of the user, allow the user to express that problem somehow, right? Using a graphical query language, using natural language, um, perhaps suggest for further questions, translate it to SQL, execute the, 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 the SQL, and display the results on the screen. So I think that's what the semantic layer needs to do. Um, and Traditionally, the word semantic layer has been employed by marketing people in business intelligence tools. Um, but I, I also want to, you know, I, 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 you know, I want to define the problem narrowly in what BI tools do today, but also just say how could we extend it in, in future and how, how can we do better without losing touch with reality and, and, and just saying, well, there's magic involved. Um, because I actually want to build these systems, not just sell sell the vision of them. Um, I do think that a business intelligence tool or whatever is provided by the semantic layer, it needs to be a data system. And so a database, a relational database, um, definitely has these components. So a data model, which in the case of a relational database is tables, right? Um, an engine in, um, in order to um, store the data and execute the queries, and a query language with some formal semantics. So if the you know I execute a query against the data, it gives me an answer. I can say, is that the right answer or is that the wrong answer, right, based on some formal semantics. So um, I think that's what we're trying to build here. 
Um, so my agenda is, first of all, looking at the relational model um, uh, and the dimensional model, which, which I claim is the data model that's supported by BI tools, and, and look at what's different about them, what's good about both of them, how can we bring them closer together. Um, then I talk about how we can add measures to SQL, which I claim is the most important aspect of the, it's the key aspect of the dimensional model that we can bring into the SQL language. I, then I illustrate it with some machine learning patterns and prove that, you know, that, that not prove, um, give some, give some examples of some classical machine learning cases like clustering and forecasting that can also be expressed if we extend SQL in this way. And then lastly, I kind of dream a little bit about what the semantic layer could look like in the future. So, um, yeah, why, what are the possible reasons that BI tools implement a layer on top of SQL rather than, you know, using SQL directly? Well, one is they want this thing they call the semantic model. They do want to control the presentation information. They want to be able, whenever you display, let's say, revenue, they want to, you know, display it with a, as a, a formatted as a currency string, right? Or whenever you display United States and Canada on a chart, you want United States to be blue and you want Canada to be red, right? You want to just use the same colors and so on and so forth. You also want governance. You want to know who's accessing your data. You know, you want to know when the data was loaded, um, do access control, and so and so on and so forth. So the semantic layer defines all these things. But I think the um, uh, the most important two are the, are the bottom ones, which is um, the semantic layer allows you to ask complex questions more concisely. Um, and quite a lot of these queries that, when translated into SQL, the uh, simple query through the business intelligence tool will result in a very complex SQL query with a lot of repetition in it. Um, and we want to define our calculations once. We, if we have a definition of revenue in our organization or ref, a definition of profit, we would like that to be based in, used in many different places. Perhaps different reports based on different tables, we still want to pull in the same definition of profit in those different places. So... Um, yeah, and especially defining reusable calculations is the, is the, is the hard part. So why should we do it? Um, besides the fact that, you know, SQL seems to always win and kind of the law of gravity will, it will end up there eventually. Why, why do we actually want it? Um, right now, if you're going to use a system like Tableau or, or Power BI, you actually have to move the data out of the SQL system where the data is stored, um, into the, the, the BI tool's own structure, which in the case of, for example, um, Tableau is a, is a hyper database. Um, and that, that means you need more storage. It introduces a lag because that, you know, you can't copy the data continuously. And so the, the business intelligence user is seeing data that might be a few hours old and they don't even know it. Um, we have these immensely powerful, um, SQL engines these days. Um, you know, I guess Hadoop started it off, but you know now we have commercial systems like Snowflake and BigQuery that are just uh, just have huge. They're hugely scalable, very elastic, and they you know they 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 are real you know workhorses um, that we'd like we'd like to uh, do as much as possible with them. Um, and lastly, SQL is an open an open standard, whereas these. Um, you know, there are admittedly differences in dialects between SQL, but uh, at least there's an opportunity if one if one vendor introduces some extensions to SQL, the other vendors can, if it's a good extension, can add the same extensions. Whereas the same cannot be said for, you know, the DAX language, which is only implemented in Power BI, for example. Um, it's hard because it's, we're introducing a different paradigm. And um, I claim that this is a very different paradigm. This I claim this breaks re breaks relational algebra. You can't do this. You can't solve this problem without breaking relational algebra. Um, but as we'll see, I, I believe we're breaking it in a controlled way and in a good way. Um, Apache Calcite is the project that I started. I'm a PMC member of. And this is kind of the, the, I'm, I'm doing, uh, experiments and, and building extensions to Calcite for these extensions to SQL. But I'm speaking more generally about the, the, the extensions to SQL I'm talking about could be implemented in other systems as well. Um, 
So Calcite, if you're not familiar with it, is kind of a toolkit for building a, a database management system. So you can start it up, you know, on a, on the command line and just, you know, uh, open up a shell, a SQL shell, and query CSV files with it. Um, but it's also embedded in a lot of systems like Hive and Drill and and Beam and 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 many commercial systems as well. Um, and so you might be using the Calcite's parser or a Calcite's query optimizer engine, and not even not even know it. Um, so, so the analogy I want to give of of why the dimensional model is different than a relational model is I want to use this metaphor of making a making your dinner using a pasta machine or by ordering a pizza, and. Um, I call it top-down versus bottom-up evaluation. So um, when you're making a pasta recipe, let's suppose you want to make some, I don't know, green spaghetti or whatever. You take your pasta, you mix in some spinach paste so it's green, right? You put it through the pasta machine and you've got your spaghetti, right? If you change your mind and decide you want, like, red lasagna with sun-dried tomatoes in, you have to start from scratch. You have to make the dough again, right? You have to make the ingredients. You have to feed it through the pasta machine again. And that's quite laborious. Whereas if, you, if you're ordering a pizza and at the last minute you decide you want anchovies and you don't want pineapple, right, you just change your order. You just get, call the shop up and say, I've changed my mind. I want anchovies, not, not pineapple, right? So it's much less effort. And... I claim that you know the 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 pizza thing is much more declarative because you just changed the question and you, you don't have to repeat the recipe. And the way SQL works is if you want a slightly different answer to a question, like if you're interested in the data from 2019 as opposed to 2020, you have to rewrite the whole the whole query again. Um, here's a here's a specific example. Um, I'm interested in comparing um, the uh, sales from the ACE supplier um, in uh, 1994 January versus 1995 January. Um, if I want to do that in relational algebra, I mean, this is this is what the database is going to execute. It um, it will basically join the sales table to the suppliers table to the products table for 1994, right? And do exactly the same thing for 1995, and then join the data sets together. So you can compare them. Um, and that naturally, because of all that, when turned into SQL, that will be quite a large SQL query. Um, in the multidimensional model, you just specify two different points. I want January 1994. I want January 1995, right? So you're basically specifying the coordinates of the, of the, of the data that you want. Um, and then the engine will then figure out how to go and execute all of the Table scans and aggregations and stuff to compute the values in those particular in that coordinate system. So a multi-dimensional system is kind of works like a a, a virtual spreadsheet. Um, so let's look at um, uh, adding measures to SQL. Um, and let's look at some, it, it, to motivate us, let's look at some multidimensional queries that are easy to express in a multidimensional database and harder in SQL. And then there's, there's a whole bunch from a paper back from 20 years ago, but let's focus on this one. So for, uh, for the ACE supplier, each product gives the fractional increase in sales from January 1995 relative to sales in January 1994. Um, on the left-hand side is this thing expressed in SQL. And you will notice that um, there's two, it's two from clauses left joined together. And they're virtually identical, right? In MDX, the query is much shorter because we have actually, um, uh, we're not doing the effort. We're not running the same query twice. All we've simply done is said, Yeah, we've defined sales last year as a new measure, which is which is simply defined as the measure this year. Sorry, 
It's defined as the measure, but, take, but time shift, take the current year and subtract one from it. And then we can, then we can define a measure based on that sales growth, which is sales now minus sales a year ago. So as you can see, this is kind of like building cells in a, in a spreadsheet. And those cells are reusable, and then I can, I can basically apply this um, in, in, in my query. So I call this top-down evaluation versus SQL that's doing bottom-up evaluation. Um, when we add measures to SQL, and you'll see that, uh, you know, line two, sum of sales as measure sum sales. Um, well, now we've defined this measure, um, uh, we can do something that looks more like the MDX. Um, and now we only, we still have to join the sales and suppliers and products tables together. Um, but we can evaluate this measure, um, uh, at, at these two different time periods without having to say that we want to scan the data twice. Any questions? Feel free to interrupt me if you have questions, by the way. Um, there's also an interesting thing. I mean, SQL has been trying to solve this problem in various ways for many years. I claim that the um, windowed aggregates, the over clause, is kind of a way of saying do this calculation, you know, three rows previously, three rows following. Um, and there's a very interesting paper which basically takes this kind of query, find all employees who have above average salary. You can kind of see the, the, the way it's written there is a self-join, right? So given an employee, find what's the average salary in their department. Do they earn more than that average salary? Yes or no, right? You can write exactly the same query using a windowed aggregate function, and it doesn't seem to be doing a self-join, right? It's joining the, the data relative to the rows around it. Now, this is they're doing the same thing. The self-join is kind of there, but this one... Uh, you know, a, a simple Im implementation of this is going to use locality. It's going to probably read the data, the, the, all the employees sorted by department, and therefore it only has to skip back a few rows. So this is an efficient way of doing self-joins. It's kind of a, it, it's an efficient way of just implementing these kind of multidimensional queries. The problem with this is you can't easily say, compute the, the compare an employee's salary to the employees in another department because you've already thrown those away. So this, is th this, uh, this approach is kind of generalizing windowed aggregation, um, but has a lot of the same, same benefits. So what is a measure? Um, the naive definition most people have used a, a BI tool will just say, well, a measure is just an aggregate function, right? Sum of sales, that's a measure. Well, you know, it is. That's one kind of measure. Um, um, but what about this, right? That's a formula for profitability, right? Revenue <coughs> minus cost divided by revenue, right? I'd say that's a measure too. Um, it doesn't aggregate very nicely. You can't, you can't just say roll this thing up. I mean, average is in the similar, a similar category, right? You can't just roll this thing up. You have to know what the individual pieces are. Now imagine that formula is something very complex. You know, an organization has a you know, definition of profit and definition of a real definition of, of revenue, the kind of thing that CFOs write. Um, that formula is going to be very complex, and you don't you don't go to, you're not going to want to paste it into your query every time. You want to want to, you're going to want to store it somewhere. So um, I'd say that's definitely the kind of thing we want to cover here. Uh, Uh, well, yeah, so this is a formula that references the sales column and the cost column. And I want it to be a new column, a measure column, right, that I would call profitability. Um, so uh, for forecast sales, uh, you know, I'd like to be able to define something like a forecast as this. I'd even like to be able to call out to a... Um, uh, you know, the temperature in this, the temperature in a particular city on a particular day, I would claim is a measure. If you're a physicist, it is an aggregate function, right? It's the average kinetic energy of the air molecules over that city at that time, right? But for most of us, it's just a value. It's a, it's a, you know, given a time and a place, it gives you a result. 
So I claim that, uh, that the best definition of a measure, the most general one, is a column that you can use an expression and it will evaluate itself in any context. And that might be a context like any zip code, any, you know, any year, any quarter, any range of customers. You know, I might be interested in what was my profitability for all sales to customers who had three dogs and fewer than two cats, right? Any, any particular criteria like that, um, I can evaluate this measure. Um, so its value depends on um, the, the, the predicate that I've placed on the dimensions of that measure. Um, so what's the, what's the data model of this going to be? In relational database, tables are the fundamental model. And not just base tables, right? A query produces a table, a view produces a table. And it's closed in the mathematical sense, meaning a query produces something that looks like a table. A query produces tables, and therefore you can make tables from tables from tables, right? So I can create a nested subquery here and use it as if it was a table, and then nest it again. I can, I can just carry on going, right? And if I replace this subquery with a table, the results are the same, right? If I replace this thing with a table, the results are the same. So what I want to do is create a new data model, table with measures, that has the same closure property, which is to say, I want to create this view, with, which is all the employees plus an additional measure, right? I want, to, I want this query to be, to, to be something that I, I call this a table with measures. I want to be able to use this in the from clause and use those measures and be able to use those, evaluate those measures in the call site, right, when I use it on line two, when I use average salary um, um, on, on line two, or in, indeed on line three, I want to use the formula in this without, without my code outside knowing what that formula is. And I want to be able to replace each of these with just the table as a black box, right? Um, so that's where we that's where we're going here. Um, so the idea is this this new kind of um, column, a measure that is actually a, an expression, um, and then some um, a, 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 a new aggregate function called aggregate that says I want to use this measure column and aggregate it in whatever is the current context of my group by right. Um, this at um, operator that evaluates in a measure that changes the evaluation context so I can evaluate it last year or I can evaluate it for all customers, not just the current customer, right? And then, uh, and, and, and lastly, there's this visible operator that I will, I will come to later. So, plan of attack, how do we implement this? Well, first of all, let's add measures. All right, done that. Um, we, we need a way of defining measures in a query. Um, using this as measure syntax, right? Um, and once we've done that, we can say create view. So now we've got a table that has some measure columns. Um, and then we provide this context sensitive operator, which is at. So I can um, take these measures and evaluate them in other contexts. Um, what am I doing for time? Yeah, short of time, so I'm going to skip over the semantics. Um, but the, the, the basic idea is to um, each of this measure you can think of as a function, compute average salary, that, pass, that has a predicate. And the predicate represents the current subset that I'm interested in. So all the, you know, all customers with three dogs and fewer than two cats, right, is an example of a predicate. And this will probably, t when I use this thing, it'll probably turn into a scalar subquery. So uh, it'll turn into a query on that table with that exact predicate. But the person using this doesn't know what's happening. They just they just know that they're getting the right answer for their predicate uh, for their measure. Um, another thing measures need to do is compute the result at the right grain, um, which is um, I mean, Tableau's LOD level of detail language is a reference to this. That um, if you're um, uh, if you're computing revenue, you don't want to multiply the, 
the total number of units sold in a day by the total price per unit of the day. You want to compute the revenue for each individual order and add those up, right? So you need to do the multiplication first, and then you need to do the summing later, right? Um, if you're doing profit margin, um, then you do need to compute those aggregates first, and then you do the calculation as the last thing. If you're doing inventory, if you want to know how many of widget X do I have, um, did I have in Q2 in, you know, all warehouses in, in British Columbia, um, I first of all need to figure out, I first of all aggregate over time, I find out how much inventory I had on the last day of the quarter, right? So I use last value for that. And then I sum over all warehouses in British Columbia. So I'm using a different aggregate function when I'm aggregating over time than uh, when I'm aggregating over other things. BI people call this a, a semi-additive measure. You can, so measures need to have these capabilities and we can express them in SQL. Um, so I mentioned this visible flag, which is, well, I've got a question for you. If you execute this query, right, you've got, um, well, we've defined a measure, which is sum of salary, and we've asked for all employees who are not analysts. Um, so analysts do not appear in this result here. And we're computing by, we're rolling up by department number and job. So we've got a, a grand total for each department number uh, and job and, and, and a grand total of ever, everything at the end. So we execute this query and these numbers are, these numbers are different, right? Any idea why this is? Because that's how much the analysts take? Yeah. So when we ask, when we ask for what's the, sum of salary, we, we didn't ask the sum of salary. We happen to be displaying all employees who are not analysts, but the total is the total for the department. So, um, and the, the fact is, I mean, do we want to, do we want the answer to be 20,000 or do we want the answer to be 29,000? The answer is sometimes you, sometimes you want what's called the visible total. Sometimes you want the answer to be 20,000. In other words, sum up the, the, the values you know, that I can see. That's Excel users would probably want that, right? But sometimes you want to, you're, you're actually interested in the actual total of the, of the department. You know, when you say what's the population of a city, you're probably interested in the population of the city, not the population, you know, the count of the number of customers in the city. So you need to be able to control that. And that's, um, um, the, um, the uh, yeah, and this third one, the at visible operator. It's the the visible clause in the in the in the in the at operator allows me to control whether the measure is over the the, the ones that have been returned by the where clause or all of them, not including and basically circumvent the where clause. So, um, Let's take this idea. So, you know, I claim this solves the problem of BI tools because now we can um, define our measures in SQL views and we can define views in these SQL views. Um, sorry, we can define joins in these SQL views. So we can define a, a wide view that has, say, 100 columns that has joins. And even if there's many to many joins behind this thing, the measures still know how to, like, the grain control of the measure will prevent them from accidentally double counting if I have a, a many to many join in there. Um, but let's see how we can encompass some other kind of different kinds of analytics, which is various machine learning patterns. So let's suppose we've got a forecast, right? This chart here, it's probably a bit too small to see, but the, the blue lines are the actual, um, um, revenue, right? And the, Purple lines are the budgeted revenue. So, um, the, the, but the, the forecast is in, is in the future, right? But it has the same dimensionality as the, so, uh, um, it has the same dimensionality as the actual sales in the past, right? So it's reasonable to say what was the actual sales in 2020. It's also reasonable to say what's the forecast sales in 2025. Um, and so, of course, the calculation for the forecast um, is going to be different than the, forecast, than the calculation for actual, but with, they're still measures and they, they should still behave in the same way. So 
my SQL user should be able to type in this query and just use revenue and forecast revenue um, in the query and just get the right answer. Now, there's one interesting problem, which is, um, and yeah, there's many you know, clever ways of doing forecasting. You could do a simple one, which is based on linear regression, right? Just match, match the points you have and just extrapolate um, to what, you know, years in the future. Um, but there's, you know, many different models and you can express all of those calculations in your SQL view so your users don't have to care about it. But another problem is we actually want to evaluate this measure on, on a year where there isn't any, any actual revenue yet. So, um, to do this, we add an extend operator that basically sees that they're asking for data between 2021 and 2025 and will just generate some empty records, empty, empty group by records so that the, um, you know, a record will appear in 2025 and the forecast revenue calculation can, can kick in. The revenue is obviously going to be null or zero or something because there's no data. But this extend operator allows me to apply this to values that don't exist. By the way, this is pretty similar to some of the issues that arrive, arise in um, time series calculations in that your data might have been recorded on a 15-minute, a 10-minute grain, and you might want to calculate your time series on a 15-minute grain or a 5-minute grain and then and fill in the gaps. So this is not filling in, this is not interpolation, which is what time series has done. This is extrapolation, which is creating data points beyond the edge of, beyond the, edge of the data. Um, clustering. Um, how am I doing for time? Yeah, we're getting pretty short of time. Um, so clustering is another algorithm that I can just look at data points and assign them a, um, uh, find points that are close to the same um, centroid. And, and, you know, if I say three clusters, then the algorithm will come up with, you know, something like this. So I can just apply a clustering algorithm and I can generate cluster ID as a measure. So given that, given a set of data, um, it can tell me what the, what the, the, um, centroid is. Um, and therefore I can figure out what, what cluster this data belongs to. Um, there's complexity in the calculation that the user doesn't have to see. And the calculation is probably stored in a materialized view, so you don't have to run the clustering algorithm every time someone calculates it. But it makes it easy for the, the user has to run that three-line query at the top. The view behind it is considerably more complex, and it's using, you know, in this case, the k-means algorithm. So I'm going to skip over this to just get to the Last stuff. So back to this semantic layer, right? Um, the vision is of something that will figure out what question the user wants to ask um, and will help get that answer and display it nicely. Um, clearly with generative AI, natural language queries on people's minds, wouldn't it be great if I could answer the, ask these questions, not by clicking on a business intelligence tool or typing SQL, but wouldn't it be great if I could just ask a natural language query? Um, so th this, this, this measure concept helps with that because it, as it turns out, um, in a sentence like this, states where revenue declined since the last year, revenue is a measure. And it's just if you've defined revenue as part of your model, it's much easier for the AI or the natural, whatever, whatever is implementing natural language query. It's just simpler. It's a simpler query, SQL query for that system to generate if revenue is already defined as part of the model. So it actually makes natural language query easier to implement and, um, you know, gives, gives, um, more reliable results. Um, and I claim, and, 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 and this is, this is a paper written, you know, about five years ago about, um, natural language query. And in it, they're explicitly saying, we, 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 you know, we need to be based on a model that is based on measures, right? Um, 
I'm also interested in the extended semantic model. So you imagine each of these stars is one of those um, tables with measures that I've, or business views, you could call them, right? But if I define a shipments business view and an inventory business view, they actually have things in common, the shipments business view and the inventory. They both relate to warehouses and they both relate to products. So these business views are all kind of connected together. So I would call these things, you know, the, the stars, I would call those business views or just views or tables with measures. I would call these things warehouse, geography, customer. I would call those entities. And those are the kind of, those are the common concepts that are shared that are junction points between the business views. So if I've got a question, show me regions where customers ordered low inventory products last year. It's a little bit ambiguous, right? Regions. Am I talking about the regions? Um, I'm talking about inventory. Well, maybe I'm talking about the inventory thing there. And so maybe, maybe this connects me to warehouses, right? I mean, when I talk about regions, am I talking about the region where the warehouse is? Or am I talking about the region where the customer is? So, but this query has kind of, it's become a graph search problem, right? Is this query is in the context of the whole graph and something has to figure out what are those, those English words, those concepts I'm using, which areas of the graph do they map to, right? And in order to connect customers with products, I'm going to have to take some kind of path through this graph, right? Do I go through shipments? Do I go through inventory? So the, um, the semantic layer is going to come back to me and say, you could mean X or you could mean Y or you could mean Z. So it's a kind of like doing a search engine, right? Here are three possible hits. Which one did you mean? And a machine learning or, or gener an AI could, could assign a ranking to it and it could take a guess which one it thinks you, you, you mean. But it's probably, it's probably best if we give them some kind of search results so they can say this is what I actually mean. So the extended semantic model, I would claim, consists of these business view views, which are tables with measures, but it includes some new concepts like um, domains, which are um, things like the calendar of the business. Um, it includes these entities like customer geography product that link these things together. Um, and shared definitions of measures, which I call metrics. So a centralized definition of profit, for example. That I can use when it, you know, whenever I want to use a profit measure, I can I can use this shared definition. Do we need a new query language? Yeah. Great. Do we need a new query language? That's an open question. I mean, I I I think it probably should be some kind of loose collection. The query language, a query of this nature, should be a loose collection of terms. Um, but I think probably SQL embedded in it because we don't really want to invent a new, yet another semantics. So, in summary, measures allow you to define concise queries without self-joins. It allows this top-down evaluation model that BI users really want. It allows us to store calculations as part of our data model, um, not externally and not in every, not have to re-specify them in every query. And they don't break, it breaks the relational model in a controlled way, but it doesn't break the SQL language. Um, and um, and a semantic model is, in my view, is a table with measures, and you access it via analytic SQL, so SQL with these extensions. And the extended semantic model, I don't really know what it is, but, it, you know, I just gave a sketch of what I think the extended semantic model would look like. So thank you. Any questions? I think we have time for one question, and then for any more questions, you'll have to come to the virtual affairs session this evening at 5.50 in this room. So. Uh, I'll tell you, what have you built? What How have I built? How far along down this journey have you gone? So here we go, Jira cases, 4496. <laughs> I'm working on 4496. 4488 is done already. Um, so, um, I've written the specification for 5692, the at operator. So, um, and uh, yeah, 5105 is implemented. But it's, it's, it's all very experimental. It's going into CalSite mainline. If you don't want to use measures, you don't have to use measures. But um, yeah. All right. Uh, I think let's thank Julian again. And then.